Stefan, how you doing, man? Very good, Takura. <laughs> it's it's basically been almost a year since the last time I talked to you. Is that right? Yeah, I, yeah. I think the we, summit. Yeah, we had you. Uh, that's right. We we had you on um, on our uh, our book launch summit. That uh, yeah, that was that was a ton of fun. I've I've been dying to get you on the podcast since then, um, for for one reason. Um, well, for a lot of reasons, but for one one selfish reason, which before we before we dive into tonight's topic, which which you, you suggested, which I love, um, which is we're just going to share a bunch of stories about all of the stupid mistakes <laughs> that we've made, and and uh, we'll see if we can outdo each other with who's had the most expensive mistake. Um, but bef before we dive into that, um, I have been uh, there was one video or, or picture or something that you showed in your presentation at that summit. And it was about an idea that you had come up with. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you came up with it. Um, and I can't, I can't remember the exact name of it, but basically it was a, um, a, a rotational grazing rabbit system. A bunny um, roller. Yeah, bunny roller, yeah. <laughs> um, you guys called it bunny roller. I, I always called it the <laughs> rabbit roller. The rabbit roller, yeah. Um, the, I, am, I was so intrigued by that idea. And uh, I'm cu I'm curious. I, I, maybe we can come back to it later. When uh, but I would love to. I, is, is there anywhere that you can I can go online to find more information? Do you have a video about that? I just I love the idea. And no, I don't. It was one of these things. I had uh, one of my apprentices, uh, one of my interns, one year uh, needed a project for school. Yeah. And I said I got a great project that I've wanted to do, and I had kind of just done a, a very rough on it but i said look here's the basic idea i explained it i drew a picture and and she went ahead and i was around so i checked on it and yeah that this is this is it and she put it together we put some rabbits in and it worked about 70 percent okay it didn't work a hundred percent and yep. there were tweaks that needed to be done but the proof of concept was fantastic because yeah. i mean rabbits on grass First of all, they hardly need, they, we didn't feed them anything except grass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they didn't need any water. I, I think 10 rabbits drank a liter of water a week. <laughs> because if they're yeah. eating green grass, I mean, they yeah. just extract it from their pellets. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so they need hardly any water. It, it worked. It worked enough to know that, yes, I want to go back to it. And I do want to go back to it. I just need somebody with the engineering chops yeah. to be able to look at the exact kind of, there's a few tweaks that need to be done. I want it to be mowing height adjustable. That's an oh, important yeah. criteria oh, yeah, because yeah. if you like, if it's spring and the grass is low, well, you could still go in, yeah. but it's rolling. So, I mean, it's not constantly rolling, but they, they actually make it roll as they eat the grass because behind them it's mowed and they see in front of them so yeah yeah it yeah it, it works that they want to go they do it themselves you don't have to move them anytime you don't have to move animals yeah man uh, i like i watched a few of your videos late the uh, few weeks ago or a few months ago uh the one with your your duckweed and 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 giving oh, yeah. that i thought geez you i mean you worked out people don't realize you know where you are where i am how yeah. far north and yeah. being able to utilize ponds and and uh, I mean you see it now I, I guess you're into snow melt or you've just melted yeah and so that way if you get a little if you get a two centimeters or an inch of water in a field that part of the field is the first thing to green up and that's what makes little temporary ponds so productive and so valuable 100% so just for, for folks who aren't familiar, can you just describe a bit of the, the rabbit roller and just the rough concept and the, the, the dimensions? Or I don't know if you've got a, a picture handy at some point. I don't have a picture handy. I should have given you a heads um, up. But it's, it's, it's a pretty simple concept. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's basically, it. imagine a barrel. It's like yeah. a barrel, put it on its side. But instead of being solid, it's all mesh on the face so all around this mesh yeah. with just a few reinforcing pieces the ends are solid uh we used coroplast yeah and it's just in the middle the, there is an axle that holds their housing because they need a burrow 
rabbits yeah. are burrowing. So they need a burrow to go into. And we simply went to Tim Hortons, got a few buckets. And it's a series of two buckets and two buckets. That's their burrow. So they, as soon as there's a danger, they just jump into their whole burrow. They yeah, always yeah. feel safe in there. They're out of yeah. the weather. If they need shade, it's, it's actually cool because they're white buckets, so they don't absorb heat. Of course. And uh, yeah, they move, the, they move the food. They move where they want food. So it was, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, like I say, when it's, I, I will definitely release it when we know and we've had you know, one or two seasons tested where we get 100%, it, it moves and it works really easily. That'll be a, a real try. I, I always pictured, man, somebody could rent one of these for their lawn because I actually oh, yeah. tried a, an earlier version of it in our backyard in the uh -huh. city. We live in the city and the farm is an hour away. And we tried one with rabbit, one rabbit and four guinea pigs. <laughs> and we would move this. Basically, it was a, a box, just a box with no bottom. And we would put a mesh top and we'd move this box every day. And it was for me to practice rotational grazing way. Yeah. I mean, this was this was the late 80s. Yeah, yeah. And and I had heard about this rotational grazing stuff and I got excited and I thought, you know what? I'm the kind that, hey, let's do it. Let's just let's do it. So we had yeah, rabbit yeah. and guinea pigs and let's let's do this. So we did it in our yard. I'd never had such nice lawn as that year yeah. because rabbits and guinea pigs both have a feature that their pellets are dry. I yeah. mean, you could have them where they were, step on it and not get any droppings on yeah. your feet, exactly. but the grass is well fertilized. I mean, they do a great job of fertilizing. Oh man, I just, I just had this idea of like creating like an integrated <laughs> livestock system on wheels. Um, where like, you know, if you've got the rabbits and the guinea pigs and, you know, you could have uh, some, some chickens or something in there or some other fowl or, or maybe um, I know one of the concepts that, that uh, Bill Mollison talked about in one of his early PDCs was having, um, having geese follow behind goats because they'll actually eat the pellets. And I'm sure they would actually eat the, um, you know, the pellets of the rabbits. Like you could have like a whole ecosystem in this little drum and just, yeah, have it roll around. If it, I mean, of course, you'd, you'd have to scale it up, but um, no, it's, it's a, a brilliant idea of, of just all these different synergies and, enter, and engineering and efficiency. I just, I just, I just saw one picture of it. It was a core of your slide. And I've been, I've been thinking about it since for, for a year or so. <laughs> yeah, too bad. We, I, I mean, that was before I, I, I don't know, I must have taken that on one of my earliest phones. Okay. And so it was the, vi we, I don't think I was shooting video back then. Yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah, I, I still have it. It's sitting around. It's just the rabbits eventually ate through the wooden ribs because I didn't give them something to gnaw on. They need oh, to okay. be able to yeah. chew on wood. Oh, yeah, now I would just give them a rack holding a bunch of pieces of, let's say, apple wood. Oh, and yeah. they could eat away at the bark. And that way they would actually chew down their teeth. Yeah, but yeah. they ate through the ribs and then eventually pushed their way out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, I would, I would definitely, I would love to see a video on that someday. Uh, if, if I can, if I can put a request into your channel, which, which is a, it's a, for folks who, who aren't uh, uh, familiar, it's, it's a, an incredible channel and you're just doing awesome work, man. So, yeah. You too. Uh, okay. So why don't we, uh, who's, who's going to go first? Well, why don't we start with our, our, like a small mistake and then work our way up to, to big, so I, I'll, I'll go first. I'll, um, this is actually a mistake I, I talked about in my book. It was probably a, a 15, 15 to twenty thousand dollar mistake that I made. That's that's my that's the biggest one I've ever made. Um, but uh, well, maybe we'll work towards that. What what's what's your what's your biggest mistake in terms of? Well, I, I pretty well tore out. Uh, I don't know. I still two thousand five hundred trees that I tore out that were in full production. Wow. When I learned two years later that I didn't need to tear them out, <laughs> I could have left one third, absolutely left a third and over grafted. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was a that was an ouch because I mean, 2,500 trees uh, minimum. I mean, trees really, you got to value them at basically yeah. their crop of the year. So it's at least $20 a tree. 
at wow. least, and it could be however you want to evaluate it. Yeah, it could be a hundred dollars a tree. So it was, it was a, yeah, it's a mistake. You know, you make mistakes, you learn, and you hopefully, if people are impressed enough that wow, that's a pretty big mistake. Yeah, hopefully they won't do the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. So that's yeah. what people have to look forward to hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and actually, but before we before we uh, start recording, you um you you had a really great kind of intro that maybe I'll get you to just say again about about where where your um because uh, when, when I asked you when you decided to come on the on the podcast and I asked you what you wanted to talk about, you th- you immediately said uh, let's let's share our our, our mistakes. And uh, we got on the call, you, um, you had a great uh, reason, which I also share. So maybe just start off with that about what's your, wh- why, is it, why is it so important to, um, to, to share mistakes uh, in addition to the successes? Well, because people easily can feel uh, disempowered if, you know, you talk about whatever you're doing. It's like, well, yeah, I'm not doing that, you know. But if we show that, you know, look, we both made pretty big mistakes in a way, but we're still, we've still gone ahead. Like the mistakes are not the end. It doesn't stop there. So feel empowered is very important. You know, I I like, I want to leave people feeling like, gee, you know, I'm I'm on the right track. No matter at what stage you are, you're on the right track. Yeah. I had a call this morning with a group from Belgium and I was telling him, you know, I looked at the the group and I said, everybody was probably over 35. So I said, well, it looks like everybody here is actually on a second career. And I said, you may have been in a first career that you really realize, what am I doing here? You know, like, why am I doing this? I don't really enjoy it. I may wake up in the morning dreading, I got to go do this. So I said, at least now you've made a decision that you probably have to sacrifice to do it you probably are not going to do financially as well, at least for a few years as you were doing when you were working at whatever else you were doing. Yeah. But I said, at least you're honest with yourself that you're doing what you feel right about. You feel what you want to, to be doing probably from a long time, probably from the time you were a kid, you knew what you wanted to do, but for different reasons, you were sidetracked. Yeah. And that's, Yeah. No, it's 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 a great point, and and it's something that um, uh, I actually get a lot of comments about because um, it's one of the, one of the the I, I don't think I've ever done um, any anything like specific content about mistakes. This is the first piece that's like that, like that's the topic. But um, I I love talking about the mistakes almost as much as I talk love talking about the successes because I mean that's to be honest that's where. Yeah. What is it? Was it uh, Edison that, that said he didn't? Um, what was he didn't it? make he, ten thousand mistakes? He learned ten thousand ways he can't not, make a yeah, light bulb. Yeah, exactly. I can't make a light bulb. Exactly. And I I kind of have my only I have my own kind of version of that, which is basically it's you know it's, it's only a mistake if you don't learn from it. That's and, right. And um, or uh, or another way that I like to put it is is like it's you're 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 only wrong if you don't admit it. Like, like it's, it's there's 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 a weird thing, I mean, and it's not just within within permaculture agriculture. It's just in a lot of domains that I find that people are um, they're tied up in their ideas, and and uh, and and you know if, if something doesn't go wrong, they as opposed to just admitting it right away, they're like, yeah, like I made a mistake, that wasn't the right way to do it, and learning from it, they kind of double down, <laughs> or they try to hide it or, or, or force function. And like, I mean, agriculture is just uh, one of my favorite quotes from, I heard, I heard originally I heard this from Mark Shepard, which is um, agriculture has forever been trying to solve two problems. How do I kill this thing that wants to live? And how do I keep this thing alive that wants to die? And it's just like, if, if we just stopped, if we got over this, this thing of like, no, no, I want this thing to live, but it doesn't want to just let it go. And here's all these things that are just begging to be cultivated. Let's just focus on those. And we've been doubling down for 10,000 years. And I think it's about time that we, we changed our well, tune. You, you have animals and you know that you're, you're, one of your kind of reactions is, well, this thing shouldn't live. It is living and you should get rid of it. But you know, I'll give it another chance. I did that with, with I remember one you, I kept her for five years 
Yeah. And every year she lost her lambs. I should yeah. have sent her off the first year. She lost. Yeah. Okay, you lose your lamb, you're out of here. But oh no, I'll give it another chance. And you know, you learn because you go, you know how much that cost me keeping this thing for five yeah. years when it never did never produced the lamb successfully. Like yeah. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's funny, all of the, uh, just the little, I can't remember where I heard this from, but it was like the, one of the most dangerous, it was, it was like a plaque, it was like the most dangerous statement in the human languages, but we've always done it this way. Oh my God. And there's just, there's, there's so, <laughs> there's so many of these little things that when you, when you really, you ask, start to ask why nobody has an answer. It's just, Somebody did it this way, and so that's the way we're going to do it. And and yeah, like again, yeah, not not learning from from mistakes. And um, and so the, I I I love I love mistakes. I love talking about them. And and it's, funnily enough, it's one of the most common statements, or called a compliment, or a um, the one of the most common things that my clients or students tell me, kind of in, typically in private, is or like they'll send an email or or uh, you know something. And it's basically to the effect of thank you so much for for being open about the mistakes that you made like you have you have no idea how how um much better i feel now knowing that like you know that, that, you, that i'm not alone basically mm -hmm. um and and this is this is like a, a product of you know the modern you know instagram youtube like you you can you can cut out you know I got almost 99% of, of every, all the chaos around you just by focusing, you know, the shot on the one good thing. And, and it, it's so easy to make it look like you've got this perfect life or this perfect system. And um, well, I think you, yeah. you have to back up, like you're saying for Instagram, but you really have to back up even further. It's strangely enough, the way we geared the whole education system yeah. makes mistakes bad. Yeah. Yeah. And right there from the first grade, oh, I made this mistake. That's bad. Yeah. Instead of celebrating mistakes, instead of saying, hey, you, you, you know, here's a way you didn't get it. Is there yeah. a way to work around it? Or, you know, just the whole viewpoint of mistakes. It, it's I, I understand because I was I mean, I taught in university for almost 10 years. Yeah. And it's hard to write a really foolproof test. Mm -hmm. It's very hard, like unless you take word for word out of a book and say, you know, add the word or something, but to write a great test where you're challenging students to answer, mm -hmm. but you realize in a class of 80, 80 students, you can get so many variations of the answer that you go, hmm. I remember so many times I'd, I'd go, that's not wrong. I never thought of it that way. It's not wrong. I can't grade them down because it isn't wrong. Yeah. And that made, I mean, I got a huge appreciation for the how hard it is to actually evaluate knowledge based on simply a question, right or wrong. Yeah. Because yeah. it's not that there's gray areas, but there's levels of an answer. and. I mean, I, I think back, you know, really in school where it's like, there's only one word you could give, or there's only one way you could write the answer. That's baloney. I mean, just look at simple math. There's so many ways to write an answer and come out with the answer. And it's not like this way is right. That's the way it's wrong. You got to an answer. You have a different way of going through and solving it. That doesn't mean your way is wrong. It does just means it's not the way the teacher may have taught you. And so that whole notion of mistakes is, is frowned upon in our society. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So let's, let's get into it. I'm, I'm really curious to know uh, if, if you can, uh, because w w when did you first get into, into permaculture? When was, when did you take your first design course? Actually, I, I only took a design course with Jeff on his online course, Jeff Lawton, in 1990, no, wait a minute, not 90s, in 2014 or 15. But I had, oh, wow. I was, yeah, I was, but I, was, I actually, 
I learned I about here. permaculture in 1990. Okay. And this book had just kind of come out. Yeah. And yeah. I bought this book. I mean, to give you an idea, I paid 65 bucks for this book in 1990. <laughs> wow. I don't know. I think it's 150 or something nowadays. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I went through that book. I pretty well had three months of just home study. Okay. And uh, I, okay. I got into it so I mean, I fell into it where it was, to me, permaculture wasn't, oh, it's a nice thing. No, it was finally somebody has come up with a framework yeah. to show how to design land. Yeah. And that was, to me, what was so appealing. And listen, I can, I can talk about a book. Here's a book for those who don't know it. <laughs> and I tell you, because I honestly was really impressed. You know, you're one of the co-authors on this. Yeah. And I was really impressed when I heard your interview with, I think it was Oliver Gaucher. Yes. About the book. And I, I realized, man, because I've, I've done design, I have a, a master's in landscape architecture. So I've, I've done pretty well high level design. You know, it, it's not exactly permaculture design, but design thinking is design thinking. And so when I saw yeah. your framework and I heard you explaining the framework, I realized, okay, you know, here's somebody who's put a lot of thought because it's very easy to know things. You could know a lot of things. Yeah. That's not the hard part. You yeah. can have acquired information and know that that's good. The hard part is to take everything, you know, distill it down to really the essence and then put it in a, in a way that is simple, straightforward, and transmittable to somebody. That's hard. I mean, a well thought out book, because there's lots of books that are out there that honestly, it's like, I know, because I've been teaching about pruning for quite a while. And I see some <laughs> of the information, I go, man, I don't know, they picked out that information from some book from the 80s, because things have changed. Yeah, yeah. And that's so... Yeah wrong now yeah, yeah. but you know you've thought through your book and your framework is is fantastic like this is for those people who don't know i mean you're, you're i don't know how many times you mentioned this book but <laughs> if you're designing your property that that process of going through step by step being methodical mm -hmm. but you know you could go you say, oh, he said that's step three, but I'm going to start there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're, gonna, you're in for a rude awakening because yeah. if you skip your steps, it's not strictly do first step, strictly second, but you'll realize, and I call it for design, I call it zoom in, zoom out. Like you could be mm -hmm. working on a design and all of a sudden, yeah. you know, you're doing this. You're oh, just yeah. focusing so on one <laughs> detail and yeah, that's yeah. good. You know, when I'm, yeah. when I'm on a, doing something, I'll take my book and I'll, I'll just be writing the ideas down as fast as I can, as fast as I can get them down. And then as soon as I feel like my pencil stopping, okay, put your pencil down and now zoom out yeah. and get back to seeing the big picture. Yeah. And in design, it's really like that. You can, don't say, oh, it's not the step to do this. If you got an inspiration for some part of it, then go for it. Zoom in, but then zoom out, get the bigger yeah. picture and yeah. realize where you are on the process. You know, oh yeah, I, I skipped the step here. Go back. And, and that's really to have a strong foundation to a project. Yeah. Because if you don't get it right, it, it's, it's going to cost you. One of my professors, he, he really impressed on me, you know, the importance of you're the best equipped to make the decision. And he used to say, all right, you're on a job, right? You're, you're on a job site. There's equipment up there. And, you know, the, the uh, bulldozer operator is up there on the hill waiting for you. He's going to charge you $150 an hour, but he's on his break. Uh, he wanted to know, what does he do about this area now? You got 15 minutes to come up with give me your best idea. What's your design for that area? Because otherwise he'll decide for you. And his design idea may not be what's best for the property. No, no, no kidding. Yeah, no, I, I, I know that feeling well. I've, I've, uh, we're, 
we're at the project I'm at, at right now. We're spending eight thousand dollars a day on earth moving right now. We got a we got a D eight in a thirty ton hull working ten hours a day uh, together, and it's uh, we had some some big days. <clears throat> so yeah, you you gotta the the clock's ticking. They don't they don't care whether or not you uh, you know if, if they're waiting around for you to figure out what's going on. So it's it it, it, it you know I think like I said in the book like um, pencil lines are cheaper than fence lines. It's it's a lot easier to make those mistakes on paper and or when I, it was Jeff Lawton's uh, quotes I love is in permaculture you're more likely to do 100 hours of thinking in one hour of work than you know one hour of thinking in 100 hours of work and that's the consequence really um, yeah. and uh, and it's and it's it's a very it's a very different thing because it, and and I think that actually if I was to come back to like. The, you know the root cause of some of the pro which I, I I do want to come back to, to discussing our, our some of our mistakes <laughs> because I think they'll be good stories. But the if I had to if I had to zoom in on on one um, uh, one core piece of why these mistakes are so common, it's that for whatever reason um, thinking and planning um, in in this, particularly in the the kind of agricultural space. Is is either frowned upon. So basically, you know, there's this like this motto: if you ain't bleeding, you ain't working. Like it's your your whole self esteem is tied up in in your your capacity for drudgery, and and how how hard you can work, no matter how awful the task is. Uh, and and I, I I've got grit. I can I can you know I can dig down. But um, if if there's a task that needs to that doesn't need to get done, or there's a better way to do it, and you know, I would way rather spend the hundred hours of thinking and, and doing one hour of work than, than the opposite. And for whatever reason, that's kind of gotten mixed around. And I think a lot of the mistakes, um, at least that I made in the early years, stemmed from just wanting to, to get in there and, and, and do something. Um, because, you know, if, if it's all in your head, and again, at a certain point, there's also a fine line, but in my mind, it, it, it tends towards um, wanting to do rather than to think. And and now I've I've really learned the, my lessons in terms of of you know those those pencil lines are a lot cheaper than uh, than the real deal. Well, one reason is I, I consider it basically high level thinking. When you're thinking, you know, at capacity, well, not maybe not even capacity, but you're thinking, you're just focused. You don't see what's going on. I mean, you're thinking on this thing, and you don't even hear what else is going on. You're just focused. Yeah. It takes far more energy to do that than to be moving a pile of dirt. You think, oh, come on. Yeah. You know, you're not, it, it does. you may not yeah. be sweating, but let me tell you, you're going to feel, you're going to feel it. I know sometimes my wife will tell me, hey, shut it off. If we're in bed, getting ready to go to sleep, she'll yeah. say, just shut it off. And yeah. she knows right away when I'm thinking, because when I'm thinking, I just go, I get, I go absolutely cold. <laughs> because all the brain is all the blood is rushing to my head yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm just cranking but the rest of my body is like eh, it doesn't need the blood like you're yeah, you're yeah. warm enough in bed you don't need the blood so it's all going to your head and yeah. and i know that's that's exactly the case because it's like the wheels are just spinning and i'll be thinking on an idea and it's like forget it you know i mean that's yeah. it i say it's hard work it's hard work when you don't have the foundations, I'd say. Yes, yes. Because if you at least have a few building blocks to thinking, it's thinking in a way that's productive. So you're thinking through scenarios. For example, yeah. if I told you, um, okay, I'd say, uh, Dakota, tell me five ways that you can actually put the spine on a book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, you know, you, you'd come up with your two or three that are the, well, that's obvious. It must be like that. Okay, give me more. And, and pushing yourself to come up with like the dump, I call it the brain dump. Brain dump is easy. It's, it's based on what you've already seen. And mm. now you brain dump. You just add, I've seen like an example like that. You do that, you do that. You, okay, now come up with new ways to do it. Okay, mm. new ways to do it. Ah. But that's where if you push yourself to go beyond the obvious answers, that's where the real juice is. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I was saying this to this group this morning. I said, 
I learned from, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Peter Diamandis. No. Here, there's one thing I really like what he says. He says, we need to think when we ask a question, because our brain works on questions. We need to ask our brain, okay, don't tell me how I can do it 10% better. Yeah. 10% is not a big stretch. No. He says, think of how you can do it 10 times better. Because between 10%, which is this, and 10 times, well, wait a minute, you have to change completely yes. how you think about it. Like you yeah. can't think, well, I've been doing it like this, so I'll just do it better like this. No, you got to yeah. rethink the whole thing to say 10 times better. But if you let your brain go on it, you will come up with solutions. You may not hit 10, but yeah. even if you hit six, you'll go yeah. six times better versus 10%. Yeah. I mean, this is huge. Yeah. One, one of the questions I actually ask myself a lot is um, instead of how do I do this better? It's how could I do this differently? Which is it's like, at least for me, because like, if you think like, well, better is like, well, just more horsepower, bigger hammer, you know, uh, better, better posts, you know, just it's a more of the same typically is it, like I get I get entrenched in that idea versus it's like, okay, but okay, but so another look at it is is like, like, what are the other so the um, this is the goal. Now, what are all the different ways we could achieve right. that goal? And um, versus, okay, here's the way I'm going to achieve that goal. What's the, what's the best way to do that thing to achieve that goal? It, it, you're, you're kind of pigeonholed already. And that, that reminds me, I wanted to come back to, you were, you were talking about, um, you know, this, this idea of, um, you know, not, uh, yeah, not getting pigeonholed on, on, a, on, a, on a specific task. And there's a, there's a great quote that uh, um, it's really the basis of, of our entire book and our entire process by a, a Canadian architect named Bruce Mao. And um, he says, when, when outcome drives the process, um, we can only go to where we've already been. But if, if, if process is the driver, we may not know where we're going, but we'll know we want to be there. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of a cryptic quote, but, but really like what you were talking about earlier, it's like, if, if, if what you're saying is, you know, how, how do I do this 10% better? It's like, you're already, you've, you've constrained yourself and you're thinking in the possible, the possibility right. of outcomes to that thing versus if you take a step back and I like, I like that idea of, of zooming out um, as well as zooming in, like it's, it's, you know, designing from patterns to details is a, is a really right. important thing because <clears throat> And I don't know if you've noticed this too, but one of the, the funny observations that I've had, like when I go and tour, you know, permaculture properties or, um, you know, do site assessments or, or, you know, even just, uh, you know, researching, you know, fellow colleagues and stuff and, or past students is, is um, a lot of properties are just a diversity of monocultures, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's that, it's that zoomed in. Um, you know, versus, versus permaculture, it's not about the individual elements, it's about the connections between them. And right. if you don't zoom out to, to be able to see the, the elements and how they connect, you can just, yeah, yeah, your farm has, pick, you know, chickens, pigs, cows, ducks, you know, orchards, but they're all separate. And it's like, well, I've got a permaculture farm. No, you just have a diversity of monocultures and, right. and a lot more work than, than you know, most other farms. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, uh, uh, that idea of, of yeah, like zooming out, thinking about, you know, from patterns to details, um, and also focusing on process, not prescriptions. Uh, because if, if you're just following somebody else's, you know, you know, what they what worked for them, or, or you've, you've decided ahead of time what you need. And now, now you're just going to go towards that no matter what. Um, that's where a lot of these mistakes, at least in my mind, where, where I, when I was making the, mis the biggest mistakes, it was, it was when I was doing that. I'd already, I was decided I was going to do something and come hell or high water. That's what I was going to do because I had already decided to do it. Uh, I would, you know, I would say Takoto though, you're, you're already miles ahead of most people your age because <laughs> age is a, is a function. Sure. As you get older, you realize, you know what? You don't have a choice. There comes a points where you have to use your head. Like you yeah. were saying, come, you know, I would power through when I was in my 30s, man, yeah. I would power through. I'm just going to I'm just going to do this. 
<laughs> and it was sometimes it was crazy. You could spend two days doing something and it didn't work. But if you had just stood, sat, you know, just zoom out for a sec and look, there's no way it would work. So yeah, age is a, is a function. If you force yourself to do some thinking before you do some working, uh, it, <laughs> you know, it, it, you'll probably have a better outcome. Totally. Um, well, but I, because it is hard to think. It, it is. And I, it's funny, like the, I'm, I'm almost 30. I turned 30 this week. And, uh, but I, I, I look like I'm 12. So I, I do get a lot of comments about, um, you know, how, how smart or wise or whatever I am. But the, the thing I always laugh about is like, I'm actually, I'm not smart or wise. I just make mistakes a lot faster than most people do. <laughs> but don't forget, you know, there is that 10,000 hours issue. When yeah. did you start this journey? Um, so for me, it's, it's funny, like you, you started permaculture before I was born. Um, I, I was born in 92 and, um, but I grew up on a mixed organic farm. And so we were, right. we were doing, we, we had the same goals as, as, you know, you know, and the same ethics. I was raised in that, in that way. And we had a lot of diversity and stuff, but we didn't right. have the process. We didn't have the design system. And so I, I was, when I was when I was a kid growing up, I knew that something was terribly wrong with agriculture and, and with our farm and the way we did things. I had no way to articulate it, and as a result, right. I kind of left farming, went and did construction, and got my ticket. And then in 2012, I came back to the farm after taking my uh, PDC, and I've taken several since. I think I think I took the same course that you did in 2014 with Jeff. Okay, um, is his online course, and right. uh, and I've, I've done a few others as well. But yeah, like basically, I, I was I was kind of born into it, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't have a, 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 a you know the the system the system or the language to describe right. what I had always saw was missing in agriculture. But for me, when I when I googled permaculture for the first time and watched a few videos, I was just I got it instantly, and, and I was hooked. So okay, before we before we get into mistakes, because it's part of the learning process. Yeah. mistakes is part of the learning. Yeah. So for you, you grew up. You like you could sense there were things that didn't make, and like they worked, but they didn't make total sense. No. And I say my my favorite definition that I use for permaculture is permaculture is applied common sense. <laughs> I mean, if you look at something and yeah. you say, man, that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I guarantee you there's two or three principles of permaculture that are right in there yeah. because that's what it is. It's like, well, darn, that, that makes like when I saw your your duckweed and yeah. and also just the whole idea of you had figured out the movement pattern. So, you yeah. know, you weren't, you weren't crossing the farm to do things. It was, everything was, yeah. was there. Yeah. So when, like, when you started to discover permaculture, which were the, the, like the things that for you were the biggest ahas about it? So the, the, the biggest ahas was the, this, the idea of, um, like interconnectedness and and like and like needs and yields and, and, the, and the thinking like the the idea that um or the and the, what the the kind of core principle is I, I guess it's so so for me when i when i break down permaculture it is kind of five core concepts that i i talk about and and i don't know where these are the these are kind of my summary um but it's the, the first one is is interconnection um, uh, synergies, because that, that's, it's slightly different. Right. Um, there's, uh, redundancy, uh, there's multifunctionality, and then there's ethics. Uh, those are the five kind of core, um, uh, aspects of, of that, that really hit home for me about like what differentiates permaculture from is, is it's they're, they're interconnected. There's, they're synergetic. Um, they, there's, there's redundancies, there's multifunctionality, and it's based on this, this, the, this, an ethical system, which in my mind, I, I actually define it as enlightened self-interest, which is basically realizing that, that this, that ecologists are far more selfish than economists because they know that their well-being is dependent upon everybody else. Right. And that's why they're going out there trying to, 
save the world. It's not because they're <laughs> that's because it's not because they're selfless. It's because they know that that's how they're going to have a better life. Um, and yeah, so and and a more pleasant life. Like yeah. you go, wow! I really this place. I love being in this place. So, what yeah. was the first of those that you applied? The the, the first I think was the, was the synergies probably. Um, I, I, although, I mean, I guess the, the, the first experiment that I, that I can remember that I did that, that was a success was when I started to integrate my, uh, my chickens and my pigs and my cows. Um, like before they were, we had, we had a very diverse farm, but it was all monocultures. You know, the pigs were over here, the right. cows were over here, the chickens were over here, the gardens were here, the, the crops were here and, and it was just work. We just worked all day long. And one day, and so I got into, when I came back to the farm, I got pigs and I didn't say, like, where am I going to put the pigs uh, here? Because there was some stuff there and they were totally separate. And I spent like a year watching that. And, you know, I was learning about all this permaculture and like interconnections and needs and yields. And, and I just, I started to see like, man, like there's, there's, I feel like there's so many things that, that you know, having these chickens, pigs and cows together. And I, I had a few hypotheses about, about mainly that I wanted the pigs to, to root around in the bedding pack of the, the cattle um, so that I didn't have to throw the manure off and, and do all that work myself. That was the main reason. And then the chickens, I figured, would also kind of forage around in there. But like I've been watching this. I, I, I did that. I, I brought my chickens, pigs, and cows together in, in one system. And I've got some really good videos fr from all the different seasons of kind of how the system works. And it, 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 has, it has since evolved into... Um, levels of synergies and, and interconnectedness that I could not have possibly imagined. Um, and the, that was the, that was like the first big success that I, that I had. Um, although it, it took, it took six years before, before the system was good enough that I was, I, I was making videos about it. It took six years. And there was a lot of, mistakes. well, that's actually, that's, that's good because in the in the beginning, you're just not sure this thing is going to work. Yeah. And yeah. and before you want to talk about it, you want to make sure it kind of works, <laughs> which is like my rabbit roller. I want to yeah. make sure it works before I really totally. put it out there. Totally. So what what I'm curious about your answer. So what what was the what was the your first big aha with with permaculture that that things clicked. Um, well, actually, it, to me, it was like the absolute logical progression because I, I studied biology. I, I did a master, I did a, uh, a bachelor's in wildlife management. So I understood what we need to do in wild systems to manage and get more wildlife or less wildlife because it works in opposite either direction. Yeah. And that was key. Then I went and, and did uh, a master's in animal behavior, actually. And that one was one of the keys to kind of looking at permaculture as, as kind of that biomimicry stuff where I was looking, I was studying mixed species flocks and I was looking at one species killing another, gulls killing coots, you know coots. So we used to, I was on the wintering ground of coots and there would be these flocks of around four, three to 4,000 coots and gulls used to harass and kill them. But the coots would move in and out of flocks of swans and geese and ducks and I really got lots of chances to watch interactions of mixed species flocks yeah. and it was fascinating like swans were the basis of the whole thing because they had such a long neck that they could reach food that only the diving ducks could reach Interesting. and all they would do is they tip with their long neck and they were down in the bottom and then you'd have this whole group of ducks and geese around waiting for other things to float up and just pick off the food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, these are just freeloading, you know? And, <laughs> and then that was kind of a basis for that. And then I did landscape architecture, which was really different. It was like, it was out of the sciences and it was more in not just the arts, but it was design. It's, it's a totally different way of thinking. But then when I hit on permaculture, I realized Molson was, he was a biologist by yeah. training and he was working in fisheries and forestry. And he understood the design aspect. And that was Holmgren's strong point too. Yeah. And so he was mixing the two. And I read, geez, somebody has figured out how to bring these areas because they work well together, but not as two separate disciplines. 
Yeah. And that to me was the, you know, finally somebody has figured out a framework and a way of integrating these disciplines of design, land design, in and how to work with wildlife. And I mean, domesticated animals is just one step from wildlife. I mean, you have better control of them. That's all. Yep. But they are still, you say, well, they're not wild. Well, they still want to do what they want to do, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah. try to make a cow go where she doesn't want to go. Good luck, you know. Yeah, it's, uh... totally, <laughs> totally. So I'm, I'm curious. And so, so based on that, like we kind of both talked about, like what our big ahas were, and we, you know, got us in. So, what was your first? What was your first big mistake? What was the first thing where you, you jumped in with both feet and, and, uh, and you know, had to jump? Well, I got so there. excited by this. I mean, I, I just, I, I, at that time I had a design office. I was doing landscape design, mm. especially towards uh, increasing wildlife. Okay. So that was really, I was like, I was 30 years ahead of my time because now that would work. But back then it yeah. was a really tough slog. No kidding. But what I, I, I realized was I had to get on the ground and practice because well, you're working on a client's project right now. Yeah. You're working for them. What they don't know, or maybe, maybe you actually inform them, which would be good, is that you will be using their project to learn because oh, yeah. every project, there's new things that come up. And every project, you're learning on their dime. And I just found there were so many things that I wanted to try that I really didn't have the opportunities to try on other people's projects. So my big aha was I need to get some land and actually just start applying these things. Well, my big aha was a 4,000 tree monoculture apple orchard is not an ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is as far from permaculture as you, know, as you could just about get. It's not much yeah. different from my neighbor's cornfield. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, I, that was the realization that, you know what, as much as I thought this thing, you know, there's trees and then there's grass and I even put in animals. I, you know, I had a hundred sheep in the orchard and yeah, it's, this isn't exactly the idea of permaculture yet. You know, you're missing a lot of levels in this totally. thing. Totally. And so that was the, the big aha for me was, you know what, we could get a lot more diverse and complex and stable and resilient and redundant you know all those those uh, yeah it all comes together because really what we're doing is we're trying to mimic nature natural systems yeah like you know you were saying before i think one of the natural systems that we really haven't gotten to mimic yet you we hear of people putting cocktails of cover crops yeah you know where they're now into what 15 different species mixes in cover crops yeah because they're basically mimicking what a grassland looks like and how it works, which, you know, when you think of it, when you zoom out, you go, well, that makes total sense. Nature always does that, but yeah. they don't use 15. They use a yeah. hundred species. Hundreds, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But even 15 is a huge step from a single, you know, I'm going to do fall rye and that's going to be a cover crop. Hey, it's better than a plowed field for the winter. I absolutely agree. But what about if you did uh, oats and vetch, let's say, or rye and vetch? You got two species. That's a step better. Yeah. 15, it's even better. But then when we get into animal agriculture, we still think, well, I put my cows there. And, well, uh, I do the sheep over here. And I raise some. But when I saw the, the example I was studying, this project was in North Carolina. I realized there's so much synergy if you use mixed species flocks. That's one where I've always wanted to experiment and I did with birds. I mean, we would actually raise birds. We'd have quail, pheasant, guinea fowl, meat uh, broilers, turkeys, and laying hens, wow. all in the same enclosure, uh, ducks and geese as well, all oh, in wow. the same enclosure. Wow. And man, there was so many, there was so much synergy, like yeah. quail, they, they do great because they, they, everybody else is scratching and they could see things that are so small that nobody else takes advantage of. Like they're picking up things that are the size of mites, 
you know, yeah. for them, it's like, yeah, that's, that's my, that's my range of size. Yeah. And so if you could get bigger animals doing work and others benefiting, that's freeloading. I mean, nature is full of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's hundred percent. And that's, that's definitely one of the things that I, um, uh, I, I, I want to continue doing is, is adding more, like one of the other animals I, I would, I'm desperate to add into my, uh, my entry of livestock system is, is some kind of alpaca or llama, um, because they would, they would fit well in with, you know, the, the existing fencing infrastructure that I'm using and just a few of the other kind of intricacies of, of like, for example, if I went with sheep or goats, there are certain fences that they would be able to walk underneath that only the pigs can. And so if I, but, but, you know, they've got a lot of, like, they eat a lot of the same or the, the, the same kind of weedy species that, you know, my cattle uh, don't eat and my pigs don't eat. And so having that diversity there, you know, Greg Judy is a fantastic example of, of a guy who's done a lot of, you know, large species um, or large animal multi-species grazing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. Like I've, you know, I'd, I'd never thought of putting that much diversity in terms of poultry together, but that's incredible. Um, I mean, there, I think you listed off like six different um, species of of uh, of birds that you that you were running together. That's that's amazing. So, what when when was that? Uh, that was the early years. So that would have been the nineties. Wow! Like we bought in ninety two. So yeah, I did a lot of experience. I mean, basically the first. First 10 years was just full out experimenting, you know, just try this, try that, try this, try that. And a lot of, a lot of failures in the yeah. sense, if you technically call it a failure, but you know what? I mean, I learned so much. It's, there's nothing like, you know, you want to learn about chickens, get some chickens. Don't get one because you'll realize that, you know, one chicken alone is not happy. No, you know, get, chicken, yeah. get whatever you're, your property will properly fit in a rotation. And when I, when I hear people having chickens and they go, yeah, I have chickens and I put a big fence and it's okay, where do you move them to? Well, I don't move them. I keep them in that same area. Yeah. That yeah. right there, like you're going to have major problems anyway. So yeah. That yeah, understanding the animal's needs and it needs to move and it needs to rotate and, and, I mean, I'm just zooming out on what you just said, you know, if fences are your limiting factor, then what would be the cost and what would be the advantage of adding one wire below and one wire above? So yeah. you're adding two wires, your posts are probably already there. Yeah. Even if you have to add an extension every, you know, 70 yeah. feet. Yeah. But what if you put in uh, emus in there as well? Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah, you know, because then you get, and then you start to see there are synergies in in species where some are actually the lookouts all the time, yeah. And you'll see other species; they're not looking around; they're just looking to like an emu would be fantastic or an alpaca because when they lift their head, they're yeah. looking above what a cow would see. Yeah. So the others would go well, who. who they must always be seeing the danger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For funny. example, right in our orchard right now, I see we get, we're getting quite a good number of birds nesting, but we always have, we, right now we have Cooper's Hawk, we have Merlin and, a, and Screech Owls that are nesting either on the farm or right, like right ar around, very close because they're coming by every day. And so, it's amazing that there, there's these hawks and, and, you know, predatory birds, but nobody, like the success rate on our farm is very low because birds, and this is one of the things I, I learned in, in watching enough birds that when you get a concentration, there's that safety and numbers issue. Mm. So you get enough birds and all of a sudden somebody's going to see the predator the alarm call goes up because you quickly learn what's an alarm call. So you start looking around, where is it? And so the success rate of them, they always just fly around the periphery. They don't bother to cross the orchard because they know they're going to be spotted. Like they're still outside the farm. They're spotted. Everybody knows they're coming. So there's no element of surprise that they can really muster. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, you just blew my mind with the emu thing. When, when I was a kid, my, uh, my aunt and uncle raised emus and I, I've never even thought about how they, what kind of needs and yields they could, they could bring to um, a system and, and the synergies, but you're absolutely right. Um, well, what would, what did your area support natural species uh, 300 years ago? Yeah. What was the typical herd makeup? Yeah, it was, it was basically, you know, bison, antelope, um, elk, uh, you know, mule deer, white-tailed deer. Uh, there would have been bighorn sheep at one point. There's actually there's a fantastic book called American Serengeti, which I, by, um, uh, what's his, Dan Flores is his name. It's an unbelievable book. Uh, every, every permaculture should read that book. It basically, it gives us the blueprint for North America. For what for what North America was at one point and what it what it should be again, in terms of the and diversity. what we can at least even try to mimic. Yes, that means that there were all these ecosystems or these niches that were available. Yeah. So you said bison, uh, elk, white tail, mule deer. Yeah. Then you had bighorn sheep in yeah, some big, let's say bighorn. There's there's grizzly pronghorns. bears. Yeah, pronghorns, grizzly bears, black bears um coyotes wolves right. uh and like th that that was just the this mountain the lion yeah mountain lion yeah but we've I've, we've still have some we still have most of those in our area you can you can still see them a lot of them are pretty rare but they're they're still there and that's that's the thing is what's so amazing is a lot of people think that you know grizzly bears and bighorn sheep are mountain animals they were they were plains animals Right. Uh, they they had to create their own niche because humans came in and 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 basically displaced them. Displaced them. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. You had coyote. You had fox. You had wolves. Yeah. But yeah. then don't forget you had a ton of the smaller rodents, which in biomass was probably equal yeah. to the big game. Yeah. Like when oh, you yeah. take your how many how many ground squirrels did you have? Oh, I've, I when I was when I was a kid, I used to shoot fifty a day. And um, because they were they were a pest in our hay fields. Now I, I still shoot them, but I feed them to my pigs. So you had what Richardson's ground squirrel, thirteen yeah. line ground squirrel. What was it? What is it? A Franklin ground squirrel, or what's the other? Um, one? I've, I've never seen a Franklin, but it's most mostly Richardson. We we call them gophers. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the Richardson ground squirrels. I, I've seen a couple thirteen stripe tripmunks, but they're they're pretty rare around our parts. Yeah, yeah. And then you had blacktail, or or did you have the uh, which jackrabbit do you have? Uh, we actually don't have jackrabbits. Not, not at least really? not in our not in our. At, at one point there would have been. We we have we have um, uh, white tail rabbits, um, but they're yeah. I guess I, I I don't I don't they're not a jackrabbit are they? Or would you still no. consider them? No. No. So you're really in the parkland then? Yeah, we're we're Aspen Parkland. Okay, but then yeah. you still should have jackrabbit because that's where the mix happens. Okay. And you would have had moose then. If oh, that's yeah, Parkland. Yeah, yeah, moose. Yeah, we still got those. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's, you're absolutely right. Like the one of the the amazing things from that Dan Flores' book is just the sheer biomass of, of like if you look at just buffalo alone, based on some people's estimates, there were more bison in North America than there are beef cattle today. Right. You know, it's like like so so like we, we've we essentially have we've got beef cattle, dairy cattle, sheep. And in the, even the sheep, there's, there's almost hardly any sheep. And there's a, there's a few goats and we've got pigs and chickens and some, some turkeys. Like there's, there's seven right. species of domesticated animals. And, and what's, what's amazing is, you know, this, this book Dan Flores writes is, is you know, the, the, there were, there was, you know, triple the, the diversity of, of large, you know, game in, in North America. And, and any one of those numbers just trumps any of the animals that we have today. And nobody, and, was, nobody was feeding them, watering them, housing them, right. heating them, cooling and them. And that was, that was after the extinction of the megafauna. Exactly, yeah. Was after which the was, yeah. I mean, which was add all of those in a hyper size. So you had the giant elk, you had the giant beaver. I mean, a giant beaver was six feet tall. Yeah. yeah. Imagine the trees, that thing would go through Aspen like they were toothpicks. You know, so you had all these species at one point and they were, as you say, nobody was moving them. Nobody was feeding them, watering them. I mean, could you imagine the dams that those giant beaver were making? 
Yeah, I've, I've, I've actually, I think I've actually seen them on some, like on some, uh, some of my clients' properties. I've, uh, this is years ago. I, I still haven't been able to figure it out, but there was a, there was a pattern of these, these massive. Um, they, they looked like, um, they, they were, they weren't man-made, but they were these massive dams. But they were, they were earth at this point. But they were running perpendicular across a stream, and I, to this day, I, I, I like. They were almost the size of a house, but like you know, hundreds of feet long. So a regular beaver doesn't doesn't build um, dams. But there was a, there was forest growing on them. But they were they were running perpendicular to the to an old stream bed. There was no water there anymore. But I couldn't figure out what it was, and and I, I think it at the time I I uh, I didn't know what it was, but now I think it was actually an old giant beaver dam, maybe. It's well, I mean, scale it up. Yeah. You know, that's all it is. You could take what's a beaver weigh, uh, 60 pounds, 70 pounds. Yeah, a big one. Yeah. He probably would have weighed at least 600 pounds. Yeah. So if you figured they probably were able to move or make structures 10 times their, the size that regular beavers do. For sure. I mean, a good beaver dam will be 20 feet at the base almost. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other, like, like a, the biggest ones I've seen are, you know, six to eight feet tall. Um, and that's, that's a big one. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's amazing the, the, how far we've come. I mean, even out here in Kamloops, um, I'm in the, I'm in a high desert ecosystem now where we're working and, uh, you know, I've, everybody looks out and sees, you know, this, this, you know, idyllic kind of, you know, rangeland and, 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 you know, grazing system. And I just see, I just see just chaos and disaster and, um, cause you know, you, you can just tell like basically, you know, all along the, the valley bottoms and, and up as high up into the hills, as they could go, they, when they cut the forest down, it turned everything into a desert and, um, and you can still go out and see the trees from when they cut them down 150, 200 years ago. And as soon as they did that, it, it just, it turned this ecosystem into a desert. But if you go up above the cut line, um, it's a, there's, it's a totally different ecosystem, just. Yeah. You know, there's, there's like a line that just goes down and there's, there is, it's a bit of a, there's a bit of a different climate too, but typically that's just where it got a bit steeper and far away from the, the flat valley bottoms where they were able to log. And uh, yeah, just like, again, like a simple thing like that, you know, reducing or increasing evaporation in a climate where, you know, you don't get a lot of rainfall and, and then you, and then you continue, you overgraze for a couple of years and you basically change an entire ecosystem. And you slowly start to to drain it off and mine the carbon, and and it's it's a mistake that's been going on for 150 years. But because of shifting baseline syndrome, nobody sees it. I've been watching. There's a there's a pretty there's a few active groups in the uh, American West that are doing beaver reintroductions. Yes. Uh, but they they're found that in a lot of areas the the habitat is so degraded that they've got to give the beavers a head start. Yeah. And so I don't remember what, I, they, they had an acronym for, basically they went in and they would pound posts in the stream bed. Yeah, yeah. And then they would just pile some brush against it just to give the beavers a start. Like they could already be piling up some mud against them. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they find that is because, like you say, the, the woods are so far away from the stream beds that the beavers don't have much material to work with to get started. Because no. once they get started, the vegetation will change. And anyway, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, beavers, I, think they're, I think they're called beaver dam analogs, BDAs. That's it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've built a couple with um, on some clients' properties and, and we're going to be doing a bunch. Actually, there's a there's a creek that runs through the the ranch we've got a thirty thousand acre ranch we're working on and we're going to be doing some massive creek restoration this year because it's uh, the previous owner tried to trench it and straighten it out <laughs> didn't didn't go too well he just about lost half his half his corrals and so we're we're cleaning up that mess now but um, <laughs> but we're 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 spending too much time talking about other people's mistakes uh, hey we'll have to do another one we, how about gonna, that. We're, we're going to have to, um, I, I, I'll, I'll finish off quickly with my $15,000 okay. mistake, just because I, I said I would, but the, um, but I, I tell the story in my book. Um, so I've, I've built like three kilometers with the swales on my property. I've got, 
Um, I've, I've, I've since built um, uh, three uh, million gallon dams or, or dugouts and, and I've done you know, tens of thousands of dollars with the earthworks and it's, in all, it's this in integrated system. And I spent you know, thousands of dollars on contrary data and I designed it out and I've got videos how I did that. And um, anyways, at, at the, after I'd done all this work and I planted all these trees and I made a bunch of mistakes along the way there. I, I, one time I bought $7,000 of the fruit trees and all of them died because they were all root bound. And I didn't know to check that when I bought stuff from a nursery. And, and then the next year I spent another $10,000 on more fruit trees. And a lot of them died because I didn't have a proper, I had an irrigation system, but the gophers chewed holes in it. And so I've, I've, I've spent thousands and thousands of dollars. Anyways, I, so I, I, I did all this work and I was, I was probably seven or eight years into my design. And at this point I'd had enough successes that I was confident teaching and I was, you know, I was, um, we were teaching a course that was the, the precursor to the book. Um, okay. That was kind of the, the first kind of iteration of, of, um, of the process that, that my, my colleague Rob and I had developed. And uh, anyways, the, I, so I, one of the, we basically laid out this workflow of how to design a property. And one of the exercises is basically mapping out your watershed. So you basically like on your land, you find every single creek and ridge line on your property and you follow it all the way down to, to see where, if a drop of water were, were to fall anywhere on your property, where would it go? And anyways, I, this, I did my design, you know, literally seven, eight years before this, but I, I hadn't, I, I never did that exercise on my property because I picked that up from, uh, I think I got it from Darren Doherty at one point. Um, anyway, so I decided that, you know, as I was teaching this course, I was like, you know what, I, I, I better do this for my own property just because I, I hate, I hate telling people to do things that I haven't done myself, um, even though I, I, I've been doing it on other people's, like on other clients, and I, 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 it's a great exercise to map out your watershed. But I, I was trying to, I taught the whole course using a case study of how I designed my farm using our, like the software that we use and everything. Anyway, so I said, well, I, I better do this just so I can actually show the exercise. Anyways, I'm, you know, I've, I've done all these swales, all these earthworks, I've got dams, I've you know, thousands of dollars of the fruit trees and, um, and water is like a big thing on our farm. Like, like the lack of water is, is, a, is a massive problem. And um, one the very first pond that I ever built uh, was it was a massive dugout. It was a million gallon dugout, which a dugout was just a hole in the ground. And at this time I didn't, I didn't know about dams and, and, or at least how to build them safely and stuff. And it was a very expensive hole. It was the, the contractor went way over budget. It was supposed to be twenty-five thousand dollars. We the original quote was for for fifteen thousand. We split the difference at eighteen thousand um, dollars. And uh, anyways, so where I built that pond and it filled and everything was great. We used the water for years and it, it saved our ass many times. But uh, the, about eight years in, when I when I was doing this 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 map of like what following your watershed down because part of it is you're trying to, as you're following the water down you're trying to find pinch points in the landscape which is like ideal locations to build dams or water harvesting features um, or to find where old old beaver dams or old wetlands used to be so you can just move a little bit of dirt and you can fill in an old right. you know ephemeral wetland or something like that anyway so i i did this exercise and i found the biggest dam on our property it's a five acre dam um, i believe it's like five um close to it was, yeah, it was, it was two, two and a half or three million gallons of water that, uh, that, we could, that we could store in it. And it was literally right on top of where I had built this dugout. Like I built, I built this $18,000 dugout like inside, like just a few feet away from where I could have built a $5,000 dam wall and held back three times the amount of water and done so like flooding all these different things, but I didn't see it. Um, partly because there was there was trees that were growing around the area because um, it used to be an old beaver that, that actually there was beavers that used to live in there years ago. Anyways, so I I I was just livid because I would wasted all this money and I haven't yet built the dam. Um, but uh, in the next years here, I'm gonna I'm gonna build it again. But it's literally like I, I did everything wrong. I I built this and I but I followed the book. There was this resource on how to build dugouts and I followed every single thing in that book. But I just I pushed the dirt the wrong way. I sh if I would have pushed it the other way, and I I could have built you know half the size of a dugout, built this dam, I would have had way more water, all these other functionality. But I I didn't see it. 
And so you're saying really, that beavers didn't go wrong very often. They no, knew what the natural no, they, they pinch knew, points yeah, were. They, they knew where to, they knew where to go. Um, and so that was that was a big one for me because again, like this is this was years. Like I was teaching courses on earthworks and how to do it, and I was helping other people. And here was this like the best dam on my property that was staring me. That I I I'm at I'm at the point where I've I've spent multiple th multiples of thousands of hours staring at these contour maps for my farm like I've, I've memorized them i know every but i missed that one spot even though i'd spent thousands of hours at it and so now i mean it's a great insight for me is i i go through with a fine tooth comb um now these these things and i, and I follow the workflow that i i lay out uh very diligently because that's what leads to insights but um yeah that was a that was a hard pill to hard pill to swallow <laughs> <clears throat> yep great hey uh we're yeah, over was, time already we, we are yeah that, that was that was a ton of fun uh i i uh i really appreciate you reaching out i know you're you're probably super busy um what what do you have any, do you have any projects on the go any exciting stuff oh. uh we have the the, the one focus this summer is actually not on the farm it's well we are going on the farm to film, but we're we're finishing touches on our master class. That's the big focus. Nice. And this will be to really help people. I mean, we have in total, it's going to be uh, 11, 11 courses that make up the master class. Awesome. So we're touching on all of that. Actually, yeah, we have yeah. a, a process for design that I learned from doing design for people that it's just it's so simple we get kids to do it because wow. you know kids intuitively can understand how to do design yeah. and getting adults to basically get into a kid's mindset because it releases their creativity anyway we have so many Fun. parts to it but that's that's the been the focus we have about uh, 3,000 shots to add uh, video wow. clips to add to the master class. It's going to be, wow. I mean, it's a, wow. it's a yeah. huge project, but we're well, well in the process and we're seeing the end in sight, but there's still work to do every, cool. every season now. So cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. when, when it, when, uh, when you finish up there, uh, please reach out. I'd, I'd love to, yep. um, I'd love to have you back on to, to, to talk about it and, and, uh, help spread it around. It sounds that like an awesome great. project. Cool. That would be great. Well, listen, Dakota, thanks a lot for having me on. And, yeah, uh, thanks for joining me. And I'll, I will, I will put the the link to your your farm website, which is it's miracle miracle .farm. dot farm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll I'll throw that in the the show notes beneath here. Um, yeah, Stefan, thank you so much, man. And I let's let's do this again sometime. All the best on your project. Give it yes. the, give it your best. Likewise, take care. Thanks. Bye.